I think um, you did a nice job explaining the anatomy and like what I, I wanted to dig into the internal exam because I didn't even know really what the I knew the finger went up, but I didn't know what happened after the finger <laughs> went up. So I didn't want to just say it like that either because that sounded really weird, but. <laughs>
post prostate surgery. Now I'm not going to say all of it. Um, there's definitely some different differing issues there. Um, but generally post prostate surgery, having some issues with urgency leaks, things like that, or just men have IBS too. So working on some like constipation and different stomach issues, things like that. Um, and then pain, uh, there are certain nerves that, that can be compressed with a wrong fitting bicycle seat or different things like that. So they can get pain too. So that's, that's just a, a general overview. Uh, but some women also have like heaviness with the pelvic floor, pain with pain with pregnancy. It's one of the other things. So kind of working with a lot of different things. It's interesting. Cause it's like, we say pelvic floor, but it really means quite a different quite a different variety of conditions and patient populations. And do you have your model of the pelvic floor? I actually do not have my model. Of the oh, darn it. <laughs> it was, a, I was looking at it and I was like, Oh, that's a little, it could be a little much, but okay. That's okay. Well, can you kind of explain some of the maybe complexities of the pelvic floor, um, that I don't know. I'm sure I don't know a lot about the pelvic floor. So can you explain a little bit more about what you're talking about when you say the pelvic floor? Right. So simply it's a muscle. So if your tailbone's back here and your pubic bones here, it, it's kind of like a hammock that goes in between the two. And for lack of a better term, it keeps your insides inside. Okay. <laughs> so that's part of it is it helps you hold in urine. It helps you hold in a bowel movement. But on the flip side of that, if the muscle's too tight and clenched, you have a difficult time emptying your bladder. You have a difficult time passing stool, different things like that. So if you think about when I talked about kiddos with constipation, it sometimes has to do with a lengthening of the pelvic floor. I talk to people like it's a bicep or like it's a hamstring because that's sometimes a little more comfortable to think about. So if your bicep is like this, it's contracted, it's shortened. I'll do it too. Yeah, we want it to lengthen. <laughs> yeah. We want to be able to lengthen that pelvic floor to be able to have normal function. So it has to do everything your bicep has to do. It has to contract to keep things in. It has to relax to let things out. And at the end of the day, that's its function is to be able to keep your insides inside and let things out as it needs to. So we need it to be coordinated. And that's where a lot of the dysfunction comes in if it's not coordinated. How, so, I, how do you even know? I mean, like, so a lot of the listeners for this podcast are women uh, around and after menopause. So, you know, you kind of touched on some of the conditions there, but how, like, what are some of the common conditions for that patient population? And how do you help them? Like, how do you improve the coordination of a muscle that most of us probably didn't even know existed before this interview, let alone know that we have any control over it? Cause I'm guessing it's skeletal muscle, just like the bicep, right? It's not smooth muscle, like your intestines, but we have volitional control over the pelvic floor, right? Right. Okay. So here's the thing. So some of the symptoms I would look for is, are you, do you feel like you're having to go to the bathroom more than about once every two to four hours. So if you feel like you're constantly in the bathroom, but it's never very much, but you're constantly running there, that can be a communication issue between your bladder and your pelvic floor. Like your body doesn't trust your pelvic floor to hold it in anymore. So it, you feel like you have to rush there. Or if you're having leaks with laughing, coughing, sneezing, jumping, playing, playing with your kids, playing with your grandkids, that sort of thing, that can be a weakness of that pelvic floor muscle. And so with that, a lot of times we strengthen it, but we also wanna make sure we coordinate so that it's strong enough to hold when you jump, laugh, cough, sneeze, but then it also is coordinated enough that it lets go when you wanna to go to the bathroom. But also, okay, so I mentioned the walking farts. You go to get up out of a chair, you go to walk across the room and you lose a toot without wanting to like it's not one of those things where you thought about it, it just snuck on out that's going to be an issue with <laughs> that external sphincter it's just not holding as well as it could there's also some pressure control things with that okay. you might be holding your breath when you go to get out of a chair which puts more pressure down on your pelvic floor so there it's more than just how strong is the muscle there's other things involved like if you're breath holding when you go to get out of a chair 
Um, if you're breath holding when you go to lift something up, that's going to put more pressure down on your pelvic floor and make it more likely for you to leak, to have pelvic floor heaviness, for you to have that gas that escapes. So you've got those sort of things. And also sometimes pain with intercourse and things like that can be due to a tightness of the pelvic floor. Um, issues with constipation can be due to a tightness of the pelvic floor where it's not lengthening enough to let things out that need to go out. Okay. I want to know from a diagnostic standpoint, aside from maybe some symptoms, how do you, how can you tell if someone has, um, maybe a overactive, I, I'm not sure how you term that pelvic floor muscle, um, mm -hmm. or if it's true weakness, I mean, how do you determine if it's a strength versus coordination issue? So with pelvic floor physical therapy, we generally, I say generally, because if you're not comfortable with an internal pelvic muscle exam, I don't do it, but yeah. generally we do an internal pelvic muscle exam. So with that, what we're doing is we're assessing there's three layers to the pelvic floor. So we're looking at, is this layer tight? Is this layer tight? Is this layer tight? Comparing both sides. I also look at um, do you have any hip or low back things that are contributing? But generally that internal assessment tells us what we need to know about, is it tight? Is it tender? How long can you hold a pelvic floor contraction? Um, and generally a pelvic floor contraction has been known as a Kegel. I just try to get away from that a little bit because I've got a lot of patients who hold their, hold their tush and clench like everything instead of just contracting just that pelvic floor. So we assess, okay, how strong is your pelvic floor? Is it tight and tender? What's, what's really going on there? And then how much control? If I give you a verbal cue to relax your pelvic floor, can you relax it? Or is there a disconnect between up, up here and down there sort of thing? So we, we do an internal assessment to see what's going on. We can get, a, we can get some information externally but that internal assessment really helps us dive into what's really going on there. Okay. I'm going to push you a little bit here. Can you describe the internal assessment? Because I'm sure that some people who are not in healthcare may not still understand what that means. Um, and this is why I could never do public floor. I'm so squirmy about this stuff. So I appreciate that you're just very, very calm and confident when you talk about it, but what is that internal assessment? So people know what to expect if they're going to a public health PT. Right. So generally most of the clinics, most of the pelvic PTs that I know, what we do is we, at an, at an initial evaluation, we bring you into a private room, like you had mentioned, we talk to you about what your symptoms are. And then if we feel that a pelvic exam would be a good idea, a pelvic muscle exam, because we're not going for the cervix or the ovaries or anything like that. What I do is I've got a treatment table with a sheet laid out and then a sheet on top. And so most of my patients, I just ask them to take everything off from the belly button down and I leave the room and let them change just like you would at a, at a gynecologist's office or something like that. Then I come back in, I give them time and then I come back in and what I do is I support underneath their knees. So their legs are relaxed, not up in stirrups because nobody can relax with their legs up in stirrups. Just, that's just not just really awkward. Yeah, it's really awkward. <laughs> it's really awkward. <laughs> So basically I support underneath the knees. I ask their permission. I have gloves on just like a, a gynecologist would. And I ask permission. I look at the outside, making sure there's nothing going on there. Because if I have a postmenopausal patient, they may not have been to the gynecologist in a while. So I'm checking for any skin conditions. I'm checking for any signs or symptoms of vulvar cancer, because I just want to make sure that their whole health is being managed not just the urinary leads. Yep. And then from that external exam, then I do an internal exam. One muscle layer in is that first is basically to the first knuckle. I'm just assessing. Yep. It's just one, one knuckle in and I'm assessing kind of like a clock. If you think about it from nine o'clock, six o'clock, three o'clock. And so I'm just assessing those muscles. Okay. And then second layer in about that far in, I don't use a speculum because that would, that would actually get in the way of what I was trying to do. So that's about the second layer in is I'm assessing those second layer muscles. And then about this far in is the third layer. So if you look at it, like I have tiny, 
I have tiny baby hands. Um, so it's really only this, I'm really only going this far in. Okay. I'm not, so I'm not reaching. I know some people feel like when they go to the gynecologist, it's like they're reaching for your tonsils. Right. Like when they're checking your cervix, when you're about to have a child and seeing how dilated and effaced you are. And it's just like, well, do we have to do this? <laughs> so it's not like that. No, okay. no, 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 no. Okay. Um, occasionally if somebody, okay. So men don't have a vagina just right. So generally if we do an internal assessment, it is more of an anal assessment because okay. that's, where, that's where we can access their pelvic floor. Now, if they are uncomfortable doing that, it's not to say that I can't assess things and help them. Mm-hmm. It just, doesn't give me as clear of a view. So it's kind of like looking at things through a dense fog because I just don't have as clear of a view. Doesn't mean I can't treat. Doesn't mean you can't make progress. It's just a little bit, it's just a little bit different. Maybe a little bit more difficult. Maybe it's gonna take us a little longer to get to answers. But there are ways outside of an internal assessment. So if you if someone feels like they really need pelvic health, but they're really anti-internal assessment, there are still ways to get it handled, but in general, it gives us the best view. I mean, it's just like, if you have a low back strain or if you have a hip problem, the physical therapist is going to actually look at your back, press around, check the joints, see how you move around. And I think that's why this interview is so important to take some of the stigma out of pelvic health and view it. It's a muscle. It's a really thick muscle, you know, just like all of your other muscles are really thick. And so to get the best assessment, so your therapist can give you the best treatment, an internal exam might be necessary. Right. Cause there's so many layers between that muscle and the outside. So you've got other tissues, but you can't really hundred percent feel what's going on. Yeah. I assess for tightness, tenderness, anything like that. And then what I'm going to assess is how well can you do a pelvic floor contraction? How well do I feel a squeeze on my finger when you try to do a pelvic floor contraction? A lot of people, I would say at least 25 to 30% of my patients when we initially start that cannot get a pelvic floor contraction. It's at all. Nope. Nothing doing. Yeah. (laughs) So we use co-contractors. We use other muscles. The reason why you squeeze your knees together when you feel like you have to pee is because that muscle co-contracts with the pelvic floor. So you can squeeze your knees together and uh, some people it helps turn on the pelvic floor. So we work on other muscles around it to help support it. It, so if the pel- if we can't get that pelvic floor muscle to contract, it's not, and at least initially, it's not like it's a, oh, well, can't help you. Like right. that, it's not the case. There's so many other ways to approach it. But if you go to a pelvic health visit and you can't contract your pelvic floor, or you don't feel like you can contract the pelvic floor, that's not all that odd. That's actually pretty common in what I see. Mm-hmm. And so the, sim- the external symptoms would then be kind of inability to control leakage, right? Yes. And so you're saying that's 25 to 30% of your patients about coming in? Well, yes, 25 to 30% can't squeeze at all. I would say I have probably 75% that can squeeze. It's just, it lets go after about three seconds. Okay. It's not strong enough or they don't have the muscle tone, you know, just like other muscle, it's just a muscle. So we have to train it. Do you use biofeedback when you're doing any of your assessments? I have in the past at the current clinic I'm at, I don't. However, I do like it as an external. I don't, I have done some of the internal biofeedback, but I like the external ones because I feel like you can stand up and we can show you on a screen, a little graph of how you're contracting your pelvic floor when you're standing, when you're sitting. Can you explain like what that is for people that don't know what biofeedback is and how it might be used for pelvic health PT? Can you explain kind of the process for, you said there there's external, maybe there's internal, like a probe. Can you just give us a little bit more background there? So if that's something they're interested in, they can ask like ahead of time, if that's going to be part of their treatment plan. Yeah. So with the internal probe, it's basically a sensor. It senses how your muscles are squeezing. Some of them measure like pounds of pressure, like how much pressure you're putting on the probe. Some of them just measure muscle activity and they're measuring the electrical activity. So the ones that measure electrical activity aren't actually measuring pounds of pressure. 
they're measuring, are those muscles firing? So the external ones are generally three little pads. Two or, sometimes they've got one pad. Most of the time they'll have three little pads that go close into your pelvic floor externally. And what they'll do is they'll show you on a screen, a little graph. So you go to do a pelvic floor contraction, you'll see it goes doop. And you can see on the screen as your muscle starts uh -huh. to fade down. So as you're not able to hold that contraction, you'll be able to see it on the screen. A lot of people find that being able to look at it makes a whole heap and helping a difference because they're able to actually see what their muscles doing. With a bicep, I can see if I'm contracting. I can see if right. I'm relaxing. You can't with the pelvic floor. It's just not built that way. Yeah. So sometimes it helps to be able to see it on a screen and be able to do it in standing and in sitting and different things like that. So we generally in the pelvic PT world use it as a tool. It's not the only treatment thing we're doing, but it's a tool to help you visually see things better. Just like in some cases, a mirror, if you're doing workout, yeah. if you're doing an exercise, it's a tool. Um, I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable and I now get why some gyms don't have them. Like I, I understand, but the mirror is supposed to be a tool for, is my form right? Different things mm -hmm. like that. So that's kind of more of what it is. It's a tool just to help people understand better, get a better feedback on what their body is doing. Yeah. It's like bio biological feedback. I mean, sometimes, especially with core exercises, I remember I would always have my patients feel mine and I would say, this is how it's supposed to feel. That's not really something that we can do with the pelvic floor, right? You can't just <laughs> like, okay, feel my pelvic floor, feel this contraction now do that, you know? So that internal feedback is really important. I've always kind of wanted to do that because I feel like I use my co-contractors a lot, like my glutes and my inner thighs to help with that pelvic floor stability. Um, I just haven't ever done it. So maybe down the road. Uh, but I've always kind of been curious on how coordinated my pelvic floor is. What are some tests that people can do for themselves? Like stopping the flow of urine. I've heard that one. I've also maybe seen you post on Instagram that you don't want to overdo that. Um, how, how, aside from like the problems of leakage or the walking parts or maybe painful intercourse, how can people just self-assess if they have a pelvic floor issue or if they have a strong coordinated pelvic floor? Right. So the stopping the urine, I've had some patients who do it a lot. And when they do by a lot, I mean, if you even do it weekly, that I consider that a lot. Because if you stop your flow of urine, you're basically teaching your body to not fully empty. So it's, it's a test. It, it is a test. It's something you can do at home. It's relatively easy, cost-effective, but I wouldn't do it more than once a month. Okay. Because my issue with that becomes, again, you're training your bladder to not fully empty. If your bladder's not fully emptying, that can lead to a higher residual volume which in some people can lead to UTIs. Okay. So I don't, once a month, maybe. Um, another thing you could do is you could see how long you can hold a pelvic floor contraction. You can actually use either your own finger, wash hands first. You can either use your own finger or for some patients, I've had them use a tampon right at the entrance of their um, vagina. So basically they can feel that they're squeezing something. Hmm. Now, sometimes that's not big enough, but sometimes they can feel that they're squeezing something. Other times I'll actually work with the co-contractors. So if you put your hands low on your abdomen, so kind of down closer to your pubic bone and you do a Kegel, sometimes you can feel those abdominal muscles kick on too because of how close they are in relation. So for some people that helps them be able to know that they're able to turn those muscles on. Okay. And then speaking of the tampon thing, I've seen pelvic floor weights and I'm guessing that that's going to blow some people's minds, like a dumbbell for your vagina, for your pelvic floor. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about the weights and if you use them in treatment and how you use them? It's crazy. 
to me. It was one of the things that I think we were introduced to early on. However, I don't tend to use them. Most of what you're doing is you're fighting gravity. Yeah. So if you're the only weight I really have people do is a full bladder. That's about it. <laughs> bladder is pretty much all you're going to have to fight against. Okay. Or you have people, if you're trying to work on being able to cough, I have them go empty their bladder, hold a pelvic floor contraction and do a, <laughs> like a fake cough. And so you work it higher into that cough. We're basically teaching your body to kick that pelvic floor on when it feels a cough or a sneeze coming. So uh, we just use normal daily activities. We'll use weights externally, but I don't tend to use weights internally. Well, do you think that those might be used more in the younger populations? Like if they're weightlifters and they don't want to leak while they're lifting weight and they have to kind of tolerate a heavy intra abdominal pressure or when would those be used? Or is it just the therapist's kind of personal preference on the treatment that they give? So I will tell you, um, in the pelvic health community, we don't tend to use them. Oh, um, and so it's just an Instagram thing that I saw then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there are some therapists who use them and okay. fact, there's somebody on YouTube who can lift a surfboard with her nether region. But what if, <laughs> Typically what we'll do is we teach pressure control to our weightlifters. So making sure that we're doing proper breathing, that your muscles are strong enough for the weight that you're lifting. So it offloads the pelvic floor, um, or we'll do gradual loading. So I talked about external weights. I've had patients who are librarians who need to push heavy carts. So we practice, I loaded up a cart with weights and we practice doing a pelvic floor contraction, breathing out all to get the cart started on its way. So mm-hmm. we did a pelvic floor coordination, like a pelvic floor contraction with the activity and then working on breath, con- breath control and keeping that pressure down, not getting the pressure as high on the pelvic floor. So we, we have done some things in that regard, but it's usually external weights. There are some people who do internal weights. It's just not generally been part of my practice. So tell me this, like for someone, I know I used to teach jazzercise and I still like lifting weights. And I hear from women that they don't want to jump or they don't want to do heavier weights because it makes them leak. What are some simple tips that you can give like the, the jazzerciser or the runner or someone doing a squat, um, to reduce that leakage? You kind of mentioned some breath techniques, Can you elaborate maybe a little bit more on those? So I would say the biggest thing when you're lifting, like if you're doing dumbbell things or things like that is breathing out as you lift. So if I was going to do a bicep curl, as I was bringing my arm up, I'd make sure to breathe out and then breathe back in on the way down. So starting with that, making sure you can do a lighter weight and then working up to the weight you want to be at, but a lot of it's control. How well can you control that weight? So you might be able to do a squat with 20 pounds, no problem, as long as you're not going super low, but when you try to bump it up, that's when you have problems. So I have people work on reps and different things like that. And so the breathing also correlates to a pelvic floor contraction. So if what you did was as you are, so I'm just, it's just, you're going to use bicep curls because it's a simplistic exercise. Yeah. Right. So as you're curling up, you're breathing out and kegeling, and then you relax everything and breathe back in on the way down. So basically you would breathe out. So kegel, breathe out and then relax everything on the way back down. So with squats, a lot of times I have people limit how low they go to start out with. So you don't go as low because when you're hips get below the level of your knees, it tends to relax the pelvic floor. That's why squatting is a birthing position because it relaxes the pelvic floor, gets it out of the way so you can have the baby. So maybe not going as low. So practicing it not as low. And I tend to have people contract the pelvic floor and breathe out on the way up from the squat. So any, usually with the most weight load, so with the bicep, the most of the load is coming up. You're going to want to breathe out and you can do a pelvic floor contraction with that. I think that's kind of key. And I haven't been doing that when I do my squats and stuff 
is I focus on core stability and tightening my core, but the pelvic floor, isn't that part of your core? Technically speaking, I would consider it part of your core. Cause if you think about it, like a, like a canister, you've got your diaphragm up yeah. here, you've got your core circling around and yep. you've got the pelvic floor on the bottom. So actually the way we a lot of times think about it is like a pop can it's pressurized. You've got the diaphragm on top, the pelvic floor on bottom, and then your core in the middle. So you really want to make sure that you're not over pressurizing the system because the pelvic floor tends to be the weakest link. Yeah. So that's important to know. And I, I like that visual of like tightening it up, tightening up from the bottom. So like when I'm doing my squats next time, I'm going to really kind of be mindful as I exhale. Yeah. I got core stability down, but is my pelvic floor tight? You know, I think we know not to hold the breath because that increases that pressure, but that's a good tip. I like that one. What about jumping or running? Are there anything? Cause that's something that it's not as obvious as a breath control issue. So how do you deal with those issues regarding leakage with jumping or running? So the first thing is it kind of depends on where somebody starts. So is this somebody who's postpartum? Is this somebody who's new to running? Is this somebody who's been running their entire life and just now they're having leaks? If it's been somebody who's running their entire life and they're just now having leaks, then it's a question of, are you upping your mileage? Are you running on a different, like a different format? Or is it just that your pelvic floor is not fully supporting everything that it needs to? If it's just an issue of the pelvic floor being supportive, then it's a matter of strengthening up that pelvic floor and helping it be supportive, making sure that they're not, um, oddly enough, running just straight up and down, like kind of getting a little bit of that lean forward. So they're not putting as much direct pressure hmm. straight down. So checking their running form, actually jogging uphill tends to be easier because interesting it tends to be easier huh. on the pelvic floor because the distance as you're going uphill, the distance between when you lift your foot off and when you put it down is actually less running downhill is a lot harder because if you think about it, there's a lot more distance between when your foot leaves the ground the first time and when it actually strikes down again. So that's more force that's having to go up your leg and through your body. So a little bit of leaning forward can help some women. Some women, when they're getting started back into running, they'll jog the hills and mm. walk straight away. And some people that's able, that's able to help. Some of them just need a little pelvic floor strengthening. When you hit menopause, there's obvious hormonal changes and the hormonal changes affect your support structures that aren't contractile. So there's other things that other ligaments and things like that, that support your urethra that are not contracted. They're not muscle. Yeah. So your muscle has to function at a higher level. Okay. Than it used to. So you may have been running for decades and now you hit menopause, you get a, a change in your hormones and suddenly you're having leaks. Well, it's because your muscles now have to function at a higher level because those support structures aren't quite at the same level of support as they were. It's almost like an old ponytail, maybe like when it's fresh, it's very elastic and whatnot. And then as it wears out, it becomes less and less elastic. So more stretched out. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, so do you have any specific, what about like jumping? I mean, that's kind of like running, but in jazzercise, we would do skips and sachets and all sorts of fun things. And sometimes people leak, you know, so any specific tips for the dancing type of population? Really? So what I generally have people start with is I have them start with doing some just general pelvic floor strengthening. And then from there, because you need a base level of strength, you need a base level of strength to walk. You need a base level of strength to sashay. And so from there, getting, getting some pelvic floor muscle strength, then it's a matter of start lightly. So maybe you sashay, but maybe you don't, you don't jump as high. Maybe it's a right. slow, maybe you're going at half speed to everybody else. That's okay. You're still doing it. And then as your body gets used to it over time, as your pelvic floor gets stronger over time, you're able to go a little bit faster and a little bit faster with jumping. I tend to have people, uh, we work on 
doing a pelvic floor contraction and standing, making sure they can even do that. And then it becomes, okay, can you do a baby jump? So maybe it's something where your feet don't even leave the ground, but you just bend your knees. You just bend your knees, come back up, bend your knees, come back up. Can you do that? Okay, you can do that. And then working our way up to jumping. So we take something that's a very coordinated exercise that has a lot of different components and we break it down into little pieces. So for somebody who's working on jumping, I would say just working on not jumping first, but like almost like a little bit of squat in place and coming back up or going from your heels to on your toes and starting with that. If you don't leak with that, then you can kind of do baby jump, pause, baby jump, pause, like feet barely leaving the ground and then you pause. The whole point of that is you're working your way up to, you're teaching your body how to have success at every level. So you just build endurance into that. Well, okay, how many baby jumps can you do in a row now? If you do two baby jumps and you leave, well, then you stay at one for a while. So one baby jump, rest. One baby jump, rest. But if you do, if you can do three in a row, well, that's better than one. So yeah. working your way up to, you want to work your way up to a certain level of endurance, and then you jump to the next level of intensity. So similar to how we would do weight training with somebody. Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. There's a lot of parallels there between just general rehab strengthening and pelvic floor. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It's just something that I haven't done before. Right. It's, it's a muscle. It's mm -hmm. a muscle. It needs a little love. So it just, it's very similar to how we train people for low back pain, for shoulder pain. We try to get them to the point where they can have success at these gradual levels. Mm -hmm. So that's more where we tend to work on things. So if you have success at baby jumps, well, then at jazzercise, you do baby jumps. If you can't do the baby jumps yet, then you go to your toes. So some people modify for joint pain. You're right. modifying for yeah. what your floor can handle at this time. You'll get better and better and better at it. And then maybe you can throw in a baby jump here and there and you just work your way up. There was also a study that was done with women who just did hip strengthening. No Kegels, hmm. no Kegels just did hip strengthening and they had great results, like 50% improvement. That's interesting. So yeah, Kegels aren't the only pelvic floor strengthening you're saying. What are yeah. the, what are the other, I mean, uh, inner thighs, hips, glutes, core, are those the, like the main muscles that we need to focus on strengthening to improve overall pelvic floor function? Or is there anything else? I would say glutes, um, glute max and glute knee. Uh, your piriformis is, and your obturator internus, which are some of your rotators of your hips, are actually incorporated into your pelvic floor. They help support your pelvic floor. So we definitely want to make sure that those are handled, if you will. Yeah. And those are strong. So I will also say, if it is easier for you to get up out of a chair, you're less likely to leak getting out of the chair. It is, if it is easier for you to run. Right. Over, that makes sense. Yeah. It's less stress on your body. So it's less stress that gets transferred to the pelvic floor. So in, if, if you have leaks with getting out of the chair, maybe you need to work on squats Yeah, to get that stronger so that that exercise easier. You definitely need to breathe, breathe out as you go to get out of that chair, less pressure on the pelvic floor. You can start that today, but maybe working on glute strengthening so you can get out of that chair easier. That and makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I like that this is making, I hope this is making sense to the listeners. It's making sense to me. It's making me miss a dissecting an anatomy. And it makes me wonder if you still like country dancing. Cause that was something that we like to do a lot in uh, PT school. So do you guys still do any country dancing around there? Uh, we have two kids, two kids will kind of, uh... <laughs> it kind of puts a damper in date nights a little bit. doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes. So, and then the coronavirus definitely put a damper on that, but we, we do still really enjoy, um, country Western dancing and just being active in general. Um, that's one of the things that are, we're trying to get our kids to be active too, because it's so, it's so protective. The stronger you are, the better in better health you are before any of these things happen, the easier it is to deal with things once, once they happen. It truly is. Yeah. Oh, I just, I saw a couple of patients yesterday for, for physical therapy. One actually had vulvar cancer. 
So you mentioned that earlier, that that's something that you look for and, you know, she's lost, I don't know, 30 pounds in the last couple, couple of months and just not a lot of functional reserve. And I don't think that we really talk about that enough in geriatric medicine, just that you have to be strong going into your fifties and sixties. Cause inevitably that's kind of when stuff starts to happen. And if you don't have those healthy habits, if you don't have that baseline, then your recovery is not going to be as good. So kind of a little caveat. I know we also wanted to talk today about risk factors for pelvic floor, you know, dysfunction. We talk, I talk about like risk factors for diabetes and heart disease and stuff like that. So I wanted to talk about what are the risk factors? You know, what can people really take control of now? Maybe their twenties, their thirties, their forties and beyond to reduce the risk of having incontinence or the walking parts or painful intercourse or these things that you're, that you treat in pelvic health PT. So I would start with what we just talked about the weak hips and core, strong hips, strong core is going to increase the support for your pelvic floor. And it's going to reduce breath holding. Yeah. If something's not as difficult, you're not going to do as much breath holding. It's not going to put as much pressure down there. Chronic constipation. And I'm not just saying solve it with Miralax or Duclax. Like that is a band-aid on a situation. And Miralax a lot of times can be addictive. Interesting. So trying to figure out what's the underlying condition causing your constipation. Are you not drinking enough water? Do you have IBS? Are there certain, are there certain foods that your intestines don't tolerate? Do you need to work on your gut health? Um, how are your microbes doing? Are they able to break down your food? Do you have certain food intolerances? Are there certain things that you just, your body doesn't like? So figuring that out versus just, I'm going to take Miralax, which is it's good in the sense that you're not having that chronic constipation, chronic pushing down on your pelvic floor, which chronic constipation, if you're having to strain to have a bowel movement, that's stressing out your pelvic floor. It's not, it's not good on the pelvic floor and have being backed up in that way creates less room for your bladder, hmm. less room for your bladder to expand. And it actually increases your risk of having urinary leaks if you're chronically constipated. So getting that figured out, getting the underlying issue handled, which a lot of pelvic PTs, we work hand in hand with dietitians, but we've had to learn a lot of stuff ourselves just because it's very easy once you start seeing it over and over and over again, yeah. say, okay, well, have you tried an elimination diet? Where, where are you at with that? Elimination diets aren't forever. They're just eliminating a certain category of food for a certain period of time and then reintroducing it and see, okay, what, what is your body really not like? Um, I have so a good question on this. Yeah. I heard once that you're not supposed to bear down with a bowel movement. Is that correct? So are we supposed to kind of breathe through our bowel movements to reduce the pelvic floor pressure? So two tips that I would give on that definitely breathing, breathing out. Okay. You do kind of have to bear down, but you don't have to breath hold. You just, okay. think about you're pressing that pelvic floor down. It's very similar to how we think about like the, some of those classes that they have now about having kiddos where they're like, just relax the pelvic floor where you're gently pressing the pelvic floor down. Also, there's this product out there. I'm not hundred percent like behind a squatty potty, but something that elevates your feet so that your knees are above the level of your hips. Because all of our toilets now, I installed ADA compliant toilets in my entire house so that my grandmother could get off the toilet. It, it was everywhere in my house. Having small children, I realized I might have made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. their, feet, their little tootsies are dangling. So <laughs> we have step stools because they can't quite reach the sink. So we move a little step stool underneath their tootsies. So any sort of support underneath your feet try a step stool or something that you have in the house first. The thing I do like about the squatty potty is it scoots up against the toilet. So it's not a fall risk. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> true. That's a good, I mean, we're all, we're always thinking about falls as PT. So yeah, that's a good, a good pointer. And you said the pelvic floor naturally relaxes then when the knees are kind of above the hips. So that's the an okay. anatomical way that the squatty potty works. Okay. Yes. So I had to ask about that. Yeah, we're meant to, we're meant to squat and, uh, we just don't. So 
Okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, any other risk factors for pelvic floor dysfunction? Cause you mentioned weak hips and core, and you mentioned the chronic constipation. What are some other risk factors that people can watch out for? So abdominal weight is part of it. So any increased adipose tissue can put pressure on your bladder. It can also put pressure downward and things like that. So anything you can do to, again, we mentioned strengthening the core, but then also reduce like abdominal weight, that'll help decrease the pressure there. And then how many kiddos you have? How long were you in active labor? These are not necessarily things we can control. They're just, if you had 10 kids and you're approaching menopause, you might want to see a pelvic PT. Yeah. You might yeah. have some laxity down there. <laughs> there might be, well, and you know, things don't always go a hundred percent the way you want them to go. Right. And you said, like, we're, I'm looking at our notes. You said if, if you had a tear, um, had how heavy was your baby now? And how long were you actively pushing now for the weight of the baby? I saw someone post something about this, that even if you have a C-section, your pelvic floor still needs attention because as you were talking about with the abdominal weight, you still had so much more pressure bearing down on your pelvic floor. So even if you didn't push the baby out, you still need to take some love and some time, love and care for your pelvic health to recover. Is that correct? That is correct. And okay. not everybody who had a C-section didn't push. Oh so, yes, so, that's very true. Yep. So if you, if you had, if you're pushing for like two hours and then they decided to do a C-section, then your pelvic floor went through just about all of it. And then, then you had a C-section on top of it, which has it's, its own barrel of monkeys with that scar and scar tissue and rebuilding your core strength and things like that. But so yes, it, and you're right. The pregnancy, even just the pregnancy puts pressure on the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So even if you did have an unelective C-section, you didn't even go into labor, just still that pressure being put down on the pelvic floor. Yeah. And I wanted to ask it one more question there on prolapse. So like cervical prolapse, I think is a pretty common issue. I know sometimes there's surgeries where they can kind of tighten the ligaments that hold the uterus up. Is there anything that we can do to reduce prolapse specifically after childbirth? Cause that's a real issue for women who have discomfort exercising because they feel like they always have a tampon in essentially. So what can we do there? That's not surgical. So strengthening is, is the first thing. So getting an assessment and actually seeing if you need strengthening, because I have had some patients that come in and their pelvic floor muscles are tight and it's actually causing their prolapse symptoms. So they're, yeah, it's, it's pulling down. So making sure you get that assessed because you want pelvic floor coordination, but in general, pelvic floor strength, and then making sure you're breathing properly with resistance training and that strong core and strong hips can all contribute to having less symptoms, having, um, having less likelihood of prolapse. And then again, that constipation. So basically all the risk factors I mentioned for pelvic floor dysfunction are also risk factors for prolapse. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. And there's also, there's bladder prolapse that can happen too. And then there's, um, more of like a rectal prolapse. So prolapse is not your bladder actually falling in. It's, it's your bladder's here. It's pressing into that wall of your, your vaginal wall. And so that's the tissue. It's not your actual bladder you're touching. So if I did a pelvic exam, I wouldn't be actually touching your bladder. I'd be touching the vaginal wall as, as that bladder is putting pressure on it. Yeah, so, that makes sense. And that's important to note because it can come from the back, you know, with the rectal or like the side or the top with the, uh, the uterine or the cervix and then the front with the bladder, right. Are those kind of the three main types of prolapses that people might be dealing with? Those are the three main types. Another thing, if you want that discomfort to go away right this hot minute, but not with surgery, you can go to a gynecologist, a urogynecologist. There's these things called pessaries that are just internal supports. They're made of a medical grade silicone. You get them fitted for you. You can take them out. You can wash them yourself. I have some patients who take them out every night, but it's just a little bit of support that can help support those structures while you're building up the strength. 
Hmm. Almost like a back brace. Pretty much. While you're you're building up that strength, it helps the poor. Right. It's interesting. All these things I just didn't know. I didn't know about. I mean, it's really important to talk about this stuff because I think that there's a lot of people out there that don't even know these resources exist to help them. And they might not want to exercise, which we know has so many health benefits because it's uncomfortable for them because they leak. So this, I think kind of, like you mentioned, this can really be a quality of life thing. I wanted you to talk about the case of the woman who is 65 and she had urinary incontinence, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure. So can you talk a little bit about how you were able to help her and what her case looked like? Right. So basically this was my first patient that I really like, this is what got me addicted to pelvic floor PT. So she had urinary incontinence. She had fecal incontinence. That's why she wouldn't go to the store because it wasn't just, it wasn't just a urinary leak. It was, she would have an accident and leak stool. And so she was super embarrassed, which makes sense to go to the grocery store. She wouldn't even sit on the cart because she would still have accidents sitting on the cart in the grocery store. So she wasn't going to the grocery store and she was eating out. She was eating McDonald's or other fast food that she could get her hands on because she could just drive through the drive through. And if she had an accident, it didn't matter. She couldn't walk more than a couple blocks a lot of times without having an accident. So we found out that the food she was eating because they were easily accessible were also part of the problem. Yeah. They didn't have the fiber to provide the bulk for the stool. And so she was having basically diarrhea all the time. So when we were able to change her diet, then get her pelvic floor stronger, her pelvic floor was able to hold in that stool and not let it out. And then we also strengthened in the process. We also strengthened her hips and her core. And then she could start walking a couple of blocks. She could start walking three or four blocks. So we had her do just a loop around her house. We did the pelvic floor strengthening but to get her comfortable with, oh, I can go to a grocery store. We had her do a small loop around the house where she wasn't in the store. She wasn't around people. It wasn't something that would necessarily anybody would know. And she got to the point where she thought she couldn't make it to the grocery store. And she did. And that first trip to be able to go to the grocery store and buy her own groceries and leave. And remember, I mentioned she was using a cart, like one of those ones you sit on, actually. Yeah. She was able to go and push a cart because she's gained so much hip and core strength that she didn't need to sit in the cart. She was able to push the cart and then get the foods that she knew would help her get better. She also, during this process, which was not our goal, but she did lose some weight, but that wasn't necessarily our goal. Our goal was for her to be able to do grocery shopping, but she was able to be active again. She was able to eat the foods that she needed to support her again. Yeah. So that's one of the things and you know, she could get, you could, she could get back into gardening, things like that. Things that were causing her issues, be able to, she got to the point she didn't need to even use a pad anymore. Wow. That's awesome. So I want to know how long this took. So someone listening may be like, wow, that's amazing. Those are amazing results. Now, how, like, how long did it take from evaluation to being able to push a grocery cart around without any incontinence? So that took about like the the end of the three months, so almost four months to get to that. This was not an overnight um, thing, but she had never even been told to do pelvic floor strengthening. So this was a whole, like once she got a hold of that information, it helped. Once she had given up exercise because of the leaks early on, like this had been years past, Hmm. but getting back into some form of strengthening, she took it on really quick because it's just, she hadn't been able to. So there's, there's different things with that. We did, we worked with her, her doctor on when she took her water pill. Oh, interesting. Okay. Tell me about that. So if you take a water pill for high blood pressure, it can cause your body to lose water. That's what it's there for and therefore decrease blood pressure. But when you do that, you have to go pee more often. So with her, it was timing. It was okay, you took the water pill, you know, for the next two to three hours, you should probably stay close to a bathroom (laughs) because that pill is just going to 
filter out that water and it's going to exit stage right. So for her, it was just a, a little bit more, okay, knowing what foods you need to eat to not have the diarrhea, knowing what medications you're on and how that affects your bladder and your bowels. So just handing back that control to her and letting her fully understand the situation. Okay, now you fully understand the situation. Now, how do we incorporate that into what you want to be able to do? Yeah, I, I think that's awesome. There's no quick fixes. You know, it's just like other muscles. When you strengthen them at the gym, we say, you're physiologically making changes right away, but you might not notice any results on the outside for three months. Same thing with the pelvic floor. You know, the second that she started strengthening, she noticed things, but it kind of, you have to get past a certain threshold to be able to see the functional changes with the pelvic floor. So it's not an immediate quick fix, just like nothing is, you know, (laughs) unfortunately there, that just doesn't exist. But I wanted to know, you talked about the fiber, you talked about an elimination diet, you talked about exercises, talked a little bit about ergonomics regarding like walking uphill Were there, was there anything else about ergonomics that you wanted to touch on for helping incontinence symptoms? So I would say some of that is if any of you sit for either a job or you sit a lot, it's making sure that you're not slumped into like the C position. Okay. Your like shoulder- I am right now. <laughs> So your shoulders aren't super forward because that puts a lot of pressure through your abdomen. And when you put that much pressure, again, just like everything else we mentioned, you're putting pressure down on the bladder. So that is, that's a really good ergonomics. It's also how you lift. So let's say you're a gardener. I'm a gardener. I have raised beds. Yeah, you do. It's impressive. (laughs) It's lifting and carrying. Do you get low or do you just bend straight over? Do you breathe out when you lift? Are you, you know, how do you, do you hold your breath when you lift up the handles to a wheelbarrow? There's all of this stuff. So that's where working specifically with a pelvic PT can help because if you've got a lot of things, you've got to break down, definitely try some of this stuff at home for sure and see how much it can help. But if you don't get all the way there, just know that I'm not mentioning every, everything that would take a hot minute. Yeah. Uh, This is kind of just talking about the tip of the iceberg and that's, it really is. And that's where the skill comes into it. I really think is connecting the dots. You know, someone, someone might not ever think about connecting their medication to their function uh, and ability to go to the grocery store. There's just, I feel like it is connecting the dots and really teaching people. This is everything that's in your control. This is everything that's out of your control. This is the lowest hanging fruit that you can do right now to see progress and then helping them just take one step after the other until they reach their goals, which is beautiful. But I also want to talk about when does someone see a pelvic health PT versus a GI specialist, a gastro a gastrointestinal doctor. So can you give us a little bit of clarity on when to see a GI specialist versus a, a pelvic floor PT? Okay. So what I would say is with IBS, I am a huge fan of getting that cleared with a GI doctor initially. Okay. But a lot of GI doctors, especially with constipation will prescribe Miralax. And that's, I've had a number of doctors who that's all they do. They're like, Oh, you have constipation. Here's some Miralax. They don't talk about diet and things like that. We have some practitioners who are very good about talking about, okay, well, what are you eating? What can we take out? Let's try this elimination diet and things like that. So typically you can go either way as physical therapists. We know when to punt. We know when something's outside of our, I like, that. <laughs> like, I'm just like, okay, so here's the deal. This mm-hmm. sounds like it could be something beyond my medical expertise. Yep. I can't prescribe medication. I'm going to send you to a GI doctor. And most of us know which GI doctors in our region are the ones who are going to say, Oh, I'll just take some Miralax. And then the ones who really get in there and focus on some of the health uh, things, like what are, what are you eating? Are you sleeping? How much water are you drinking? So we tend to know in our area who, who we would refer to, but yes, we punt there. If I think something's vulvar cancer, I'm going to refer you to someone who can take a better look at it and figure out, Oh, no, that's just, that's just dermatitis or we know when it's like, oh, that's not, that's not something that we can treat. So either yeah. way, whether you go straight to a physical therapist 
or you go straight to a GI doctor. Either way, as long as you know that both are options. Yeah, that's kind of what's important. And I'm a big advocate of specialization in physical therapy. I'm a geriatric clinical specialist. I think that anymore, it's just like medicine. You know, if you don't get that continuing education, I don't think that you're going to receive the highest level of care available. And so if I have someone who needs manual therapy, for example, like my dad, I went to the find a PT website. So I kind of want to talk about how do people find a pelvic floor PT? And, you know, I found, and I already knew the guy, but he is one of the only people in Nebraska with his manual therapy certification. So it's, a, you know, he is trained above and beyond what we get in school for manual therapy techniques to treat back and hip pain. That's where I'm going to send my dad. So if people don't have those connections, how do they find someone like you who is specialized in pelvic health and who does have that clinical expertise? So there's a couple of ways. Um, I did all my training through a company called Herman and Wallace. Okay. That's the two women who initially got it started and you can go on their website and they'll have find a pelvic floor PT. If you just type into Google, find a pelvic floor PT, A lot of times it'll take you to Herman and Wallace's website. That's where I'm listed. Or it'll take you to the American Physical Therapy Association's website where they'll have people who've done training through them listed. There's also a website called um, Pelvic Guru where they kind of direct you either direction to Herman and Wallace or the APTA. But those are the two big ones. Okay. Herman and Wallace list their people, especially their people who've gone through the specific certification in pelvic rehabilitation practitioner certification, which is one of the tests that I took basically to show like, Hey, she actually knows what she's doing. It is. I mean, we're both physical therapists and you can see my ignorance in this interview regarding all things, pelvic health, not all, but a lot of them, you know, so I would never, ever refer someone to me for pelvic health issues, you know? (laughs) So I think it's really important that, like you said, we all know our strengths and we know when to punt. And I think it's important to know where to punt, like, where are we going to refer someone to? So that Herman and Wallace is a new resource I didn't know about. And then the find a PT website. So if anyone is interested in physical therapy and they are, and they're looking for someone who has some sort of specialty, whether that's orthopedics or manual therapy or geriatrics or cardiopulmonary or pediatrics or neuro there's a lot of different specializations out there that, and I would not send someone to, a, to someone who's not a specialist anymore, or at least doesn't have extensive clinical experience in that area. So I don't know. I'm just kind of a big advocate for get the, get the best darn care that you can, you know, it's, it's out there. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of digging to find it. So is there anything else that you wanted to share with our listeners today about, you know, pelvic floor, pelvic wellness, um, before we wrap it up? I would say my big thing is I have a lot of patients who come in and say, this might be too much information or this is gross, but it's like, guys, we do this all day. I care about the person in front of me. Like nothing. I have very rarely been surprised by something. It's not too much information. It's not embarrassed. Like for me, it's, you're not going to make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm very rarely have I ever been made uncomfortable by somebody's symptoms, right? You're not to make us uncomfortable. We're here for you. We want you better. We come into the, this sphere, we come into this field because we want to help people. Our professors laugh that we all say the same thing. Every single interview year after year that we want to be so true. We just want to help. Why do you want to be a physical therapist in our interview? I just want to help people. Yeah. Everyone. I'm sure everyone says that. Everyone. That's why we're here. So it's not too much information and it helps dramatically when we get the whole picture. It does. I mean, we can't help you unless you give us the full picture. I mean, I obviously help with weight loss and that's why I love when people track their food so that I can help them better. It's like, if I don't see what you're eating, I can't give you the best advice possible. So it's a really similar thing on the better information you can give us, the better information we can give you. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for your time today. Where can people contact you or learn, learn more about you? So actually I, if you have an Instagram, my handle is get pelvic floored. That's where I do a lot of my, um, educational tidbits and things like that. You can actually contact me through that or 
Uh, my Gmail is getpelvicfloored at gmail.com. You can email me and maybe you're having trouble finding a pelvic PT in your region. I can give you some like quick questions to ask. You can ask about which classes they've been to. You can, and I can give you a feel for that. Just finding somebody in your region, or if you're, you know, if you happen to be in the Kansas City region, I can tell you, tell you a little bit more about where I'm currently practicing and things like that. But that, that's where you can reach out to me. Perfect. Well, this is really informative. I hope our listeners like the little um, pivot from our normal weight loss conversation. I know I did. I always like learning new things. So thanks again for your expertise. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Yep. Bye.